Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Saturation, Maturation, and Consolidation, Changing Buyer Behaviors and Vendor Strategies in Mobile Devices, which will discuss the recent results of our devices benchmark. I'm Allison Crawford, and I'll be your host for today's session. The astounding growth rate of smartphone and tablet sales has plummeted from low double digits to high single digits, as is customary in maturing markets. Mobile device growth hit the wall at an alarming rate because adoption of the devices grows too fast. At the same time, new products are met with an increasing level of boredom. Smartphones and tablets are good products, but they are only getting slightly better. Increasing sales and boredom with products are making customers change their approach to these devices, and vendors that recognize and address these changes can continue to progress in an increasingly challenging product category. Over the next 45 minutes, analyst Jack Narcotta and principal analyst Ezra Gothel will walk you through this market shift and how this will affect your business. Before Jack and Ezra get started, I'd like to cover some housekeeping items. First, we're recording today's session and posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit this channel to watch this presentation or any of the others we've posted. Second, we want to hear your opinions and thoughts on the materials we're presenting. Please send any questions or comments to the Q&A or chat function. Jack and Ezra will address them at the end of the presentation, or you can set up a client discussion for more detailed inquiry. You can reach out to Jack, myself, or Ezra at the end of the presentation to set up that conversation. Third, we'll send up the slides to everyone registered for today's webinar within 24 hours of the conclusion of the presentation. You can also find these slides, as well as other thought leadership pieces, webinar decks, and commentaries on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net backslash tbr underscore market underscore insight. Now let me introduce Jack Narcotta and Ezra Gothel. Jack has more than 15 years in the IT industry, which ranges from the early days of Ethernet and telecommunications to the current revolution in mobile technology. As an analyst in TBR's computing practice, Jack is primarily responsible for reporting on hardware vendors such as Nokia, Motorola, Samsung, and Sony, as well as focusing on trends and opportunities within the Chrome, Android, and iOS ecosystems. Ezra leads our coverage of PCs, mobile devices, and other Internet of Things, as well as device platforms. He is the principal researcher on projects including consumer and business tablets, PC warranties, PC supply chains, mobile device strategies, app stores, and social networking. He's been covering the computing industry for over 20 years, and his insight has proven invaluable to our hardware clients. And with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Ezra. Thank you, Allison. So for today's presentation, I wanted to pack in some, some news-related items. So we're going to be going through current events in the industry, including the saturation, maturation, and consolidation cycle, but including some other things. So let's begin. There I am. So what, what we've seen happen is, is PCs from one direction, that is showing some signs of recovery, and mobile devices from, from the other direction slowing down, have settled in to a, a new level of maturation. And while the, we can expect the industry to be showing major changes going forward, the rate of change has definitely slowed down. So we, we see um, vendors cr composing longer-term strategies and adapting to a, to a situation that's not quite as chaotic. I wanted to also address some of the news items that have come out in the last couple of weeks. The Microsoft memo and layoffs and the Apple and IBM uh, announcement. We're going to talk about the fact that while we, we cover PCs and mobile devices and other things all together, we're really talking about two industries with some overlap but not complete overlap. Talk about PCs and their return to modest growth. Talk about mobile devices and what's happening as their growth slows. And we'll talk about the new customer behaviors. They're new for mobile devices. They look fo somewhat familiar for, for the PC vendors. And then looking for profit and growth in the, in the somewhat new environment. So let's begin with the recent events. First, uh, the week before last, uh, Satya Nadella, the new CEO of, of Microsoft, um, uh, published a, a long memo on the new orientation of Microsoft, and it's very rich in, in terms of indications of where he wants to take Microsoft and where Microsoft is likely to go. But I want to focus on, on two of the things that I think he did that solved a number of problems. The first was to to solve the, the ongoing conundrum that Microsoft has long faced between consumer and commercial. That is to say, since, since Microsoft 
evolved as basically an operating system and an operating system plus applications company. It's been making products primarily for the business market. That is to say, Windows and Office, its, its core products, are for the business market. But they're also sold to consumers. And that has, that, that's confused the market, it's confused the customers, and it's confused Microsoft. An operating system for consumers doesn't need many of the bells and whistles that, that Windows has, but one that is significantly incompatible with Windows wouldn't work for many of the purposes to which consumers put their products. And frankly, the Windows operating system is not as polished as a consumer product should be, as a consumer product. It's, it's complexity, it's error messages, it, all of it don't lend itself to being a consumer product. And that's one of the reasons that the mobile device operating systems were greeted with such, such relief. What, my, what Nadella said was, we are in the realm of productivity. He was careful to extend productivity to include cool things like, like creating music and, and, and graphics, but it basically comes down to writing, doing presentations, creating spreadsheets, and doing the, 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 the business work that involves things like CRM and ERP and, and that sort of thing. And that Microsoft is a company that's doing those, providing the tools, the platforms with which to do that, those things. And it's providing them to customers of all types, customers that are businesses, customers that are people in businesses, and end users. Because the fact is that, that consumers often need to do things that Microsoft products dominate in. And that has created, created a lot of confusion in the market, in the Microsoft. And by saying, we focus on what people are doing, not who they are, or not what their current role is, I think Microsoft will move forward in creating products that serve those needs more effectively. The other conundrum that, that Microsoft solved was the issue of, is it a software company? Is it a services company? And he called it a platforms company. And platforms involve a certain level of integration that goes beyond the kinds of individual standalone products that Microsoft has produced. And it also liberates Microsoft from the tyranny of the operating system. That is to say, a lot of the world regarded Microsoft as failing in that its operating system ex did not extend successfully into mobile devices, that uh, Windows Phone is, is not a terribly widely accepted smartphone operating system, and that Windows for tablets is uh, secondarily in, it's secondary in the tablet market, especially in the consumer tablet market. This also makes, makes it more sense that Microsoft should be providing things like Office for iOS, and we can expect Office for, for Android at, as well. And it certainly provides Office for the web, which is accessible from, from all platforms. So the platform that Microsoft is providing is sometimes independent of the operating system. It's a productivity platform. It is, we've called them suites. They're collections of products that don't really stand alone very much or very well anymore. And I think we can expect the same kind of merger of standalone products in Microsoft server-based products, all united uh, in, in, on the Azure platform. I think these are two major changes that Microsoft that, that Nadella is seeking to, to make with Microsoft, and he's organizing to make those changes. The last thing I want to say about Microsoft is I think that a focus on data-driven decision-making may help some with, with Microsoft's problems with user interface. Now, this is really a matter for, for the end-user products, for the operating system, and for Office, less a problem for the server-based products. But quite frankly, Microsoft has not kept up with refinements in, in user interface and user interface refinement, user interface finishing. And I think this is because the, the usability testing at Microsoft has been unempowered over recent years. And I think Adele is going to use the data from us, usability testing to drive products that are easy to use and that solve some of their more obvious interface pro products. Altogether, I think that Adela memo bodes well for Microsoft and bodes well for, for the universe of users and for the vendors who are Microsoft partners. I also think, by the way, for, you, for those of, of you who are uh, PC vendors, that Microsoft is 
probably not likely going forward to try to compete uh, aggressively against you in the PC market. Uh, as far as the layoffs go, I think that they were a necessary step. I hope for the sake of of the, the people at Microsoft and, and for the people related to people at Microsoft that this is the last, that Microsoft needed to reorient itself and it needed to, to make some changes. Um, I was pleased to see that the effort is, is being made to make this as quick as possible. The fact that some effects will linger for, for another year is not good for Microsoft and I hope that those lingering effects will be minimal. Let's go on to the Apple IBM announcement. Now, the context for this is that all the major enterprise service and software vendors, solutions vendors, have created clients for iOS and for Android, for that matter. So mobile front ends for, for uh, enterprise back end systems are nothing new. What Apple has done has, has been to, what IBM has done has to, been to provide what IBM likes to provide. They like, they like to provide a, a, uh, a complete and polished solution. They're willing to integrate with other vendors, but they want to be the complete solution. And this is a similarity between them and, and, and Apple. So by providing Apple-assisted client software, by providing a way of delivering service on Apple devices, by providing a way of selling Apple devices in the enterprise, although I think the sales will be relatively low, IBM has been able to provide a more complete solution to its all blue, true blue customers. Apple has benefited from uh, an, more of a perception change than a real change. Apple has been always been somewhat enterprise friendly. It draws the line at letting businesses influence the, the user experience for its products but the internals of Apple products have always been responsive to the needs of, of, of business users. And Apple has said repeatedly, we, we are broadly represented in the enterprise. So this highlights that fact and makes it clear that Apple is, is well endorsed by, by a major enterprise vendor. So let's move on and talk a bit about what's going on in, in the industry. We've had a tendency to talk about uh, PCs and mobile devices as if they are the same business. But in fact, there are differences. There are overlaps, but there are differences. For our major vendors, very few of the vendors cover the full scope of, of PCs and mobile devices, at least in large scale. While the major PC vendors, HP and Dell, have, have Android tablets, they're a small part of their business. They've only recently become involved in them. Lenovo is the, the one major PC vendor that is all in in mobile devices and is quite strong in smartphones. The mobile devices vendors, um, Samsung in particular, are, are not really in PCs. Of course, Apple is, but in a, in a, in a separate kind of PC. So we see two different kinds of vendors here with two different sets of co concerns. We also see some differences in the market. Both categories of goods are sold into the consumer market, but for the, for the most part, PCs are sold, uh, mobile devices are not sold significantly into the large business market where, where PCs are. So the P PC vendors have to serve two markets, and the mobile device vendors, vendors for the most part, serve the, the, uh, the, the, um, the consumer market. There also have been changes, uh, differences in their histories. Of course, PCs are, are very mature. They've been around for many, many years. And, and uh, mobile devices really took off. The first one that had a, a significant uh, impact was, the, was the, um, the BlackBerry, although the Palm Pilot existed before that as a purely business-oriented device. Um, but now uh, with, with, that, with smartphones and, and, and tablets, the modern era, the touchscreen era, really is less than 10 years old. We've seen incredibly rapid growth, and we've seen marketing that is oriented around, marketing and sales that are oriented around the very rapid growth of these products, and specifically around the fact that these products are being sold in large part to customers who have never owned one of these before. 
We're now moving into a more of a replacement and competitive market, as I'll discuss going forward. So the two businesses have differences. They also have similarities, and similarities are increasing as PCs show some sign of revival and mobile devices show some sign of seeking a longer-term, more moderate growth uh, situation. So let's talk about commercial PCs and, and commercial PCs bouncing back. Now, this is not a high bounce. Um, wh what we've seen, rather, is a recognition that, that the, the, the theory that tablets were going to seriously dis displace PCs uh, proved not to be correct. The PCs really are a productivity necessity. And the, the where, where that necessity is clearest is in businesses, and therefore the commercial ones showed the rebound sooner. We don't expect this to be a high rebound. The largest cause of, of the slowdown and, and drop in PC sales was extended life cycles for PCs. This was a consequence of a number of things. The fact that the PCs themselves are more robust, the fact that the significant innovations in PCs had slowed down, the fact that some of the budgets for many of the buyers, especially uh, consumer buyers, were now being all allocated to other devices. But now those PCs that are being kept somewhat longer than they were being kept in the past are now beginning to age out. One of the causes was, was, a, was a perturbation in the PC purchasing cycle introduced by the, the Great Recession, where PC purchases were put off, then refreshed, and now we're seeing those PCs purchased during the refresh beginning to show some, some age. We've also seen some, some movement in the PC business more than we've seen in years in the new form factors in the two-in-ones, in the endorsement of, of touchscreens, also in the uh, getting used to the, the major innovation that was Windows 8. I think Windows 8 is a, is a, is a positive innovation. It certainly is difficult to get used to for, for existing PC users, but it was a necessary change, and, and, and Microsoft did an impressive job of integrating two really different kinds of form factors. When I talk about PCs, I talk about Windows tablets. In the past, I've said I talk about Windows tablets size 10 inch and more. It's beginning to seem like those are Windows tablets because a Windows tablet is, in essence, a PC. If you, you buy simply the tablet form itself, you can transform it into PC with the addition of, of a keyboard and, if you like, a mouse and, if you like, a larger screen. All those things turn it into a full-fledged PC, and therefore, the, the overlap between the two devices is, is, is very great, and when we talk about PCs being seen as necessary, they can be replaced by Windows tablets. Now, what we're seeing is a modest PC recovery, and I think what we can see going forward is, is uh, single-digit growth for PCs, occasional lapses into declines, occasional surges, but we've got a product that grows along with the global economy, and has a replacement cycle underlying it. And that's, that's kind of a mature market. And when I talk about PCs, I talk about Chrome OS. Chrome OS, while it's, it's made a lot of, of, of numbers for a, a device starting from zero, isn't really beginning to impinge on the PC market. But there it's a pretty straightforward uh, substitution for a Windows PC. And we expect growth in the, in the Chrome OS market. So when we talk about the PC market, we talk about both these platforms. And we think that the, the, the rebound in, in, in uh, the, the, uh, the commercial space in PCs will be followed by a rebound in the consumer space in PCs as consumers find that if they can afford it, substituting a consumer-oriented tablet for a productivity device like a PC is a very frustrating experience. As I said, we expect modest growth. And we think that at this point, the PC vendors have uh, stopped undercutting each other in an attempt to, to slow the decline in their sales and, and have scaled their, their expectations of growth back to the point where we can see stable margins in the PC business going forward. These are not high margins. I remind you that the, the profit in PCs largely goes to, to Microsoft and Intel, not to the PC vendors. Um, and we've seen some consolidation. We've seen Sony go out of the market. We've seen Acer very much weaken. 
and and we expect there to be some further consolidation going forward. Samsung may exit the Windows PC market. And we can expect ASP declines, not because of, of cutthroat pricing, but because prices are decreasing at both the high and low ends of this market. Microsoft has made it clear that it's making adjustments to its licensing fees to allow there to be lower priced uh, PCs. Intel has provided more and more robust low end processors, and the the hardware associated with the higher end PCs, the touch screens and and, and higher resolution screen, uh, higher resolution screens have also come down in price, as have have the prices of solid state drives. So we can expect to see ASP declines, so that you may see declines in PC revenue, but the unit numbers should show that moderate growth. Let's talk about mobile devices and. And slowing isn't quite the word. Hitting, hitting a wall is more like it. The, the, the growth rate in mobile devices has, has been reduced very significantly, where it was in the uh, double, high double digits, mid double digits. Now we're looking at the very lowest double digits and sometimes even high single digits. And what we've basically seen is a saturation in the market. Uh, in the market, in, in mature markets, in the uh, higher end markets, in the markets where where the smartphone was an affordable item, not a difficult product choice. So what we've re what we've seen is now we're in a replacement cycle, and not only are we are in a replacement cycle, but we're beginning to see the the life cycle extend for a couple of reasons. One is the 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 maturation in the product itself. Uh, a a new phone do doesn't have as more as much more new, great new stuff as it did a couple of years ago. Now there's some changes in the subsidization uh, policies in, in some of the markets where, where smartphone phone purchases are subsidized and, and help drive a two-year replacement cycle. The high-end purchasers are gone. They're not gone, gone in the sense that they're not buying smartphones. They're simply not new purchasers any longer. And the average price, prices as the new purchases are lower and purchases will fall the other, there are maturation reasons for, small, for average prices falling. And the emerging markets the, where there is growth are limited by the cost of data plans. But we still see growth in emerging markets, and we see some creative data plan pricing in emerging markets. I'm looking forward to some, some aggressively creative data plan pricing in emerging markets. And the thing I think would be a real market mover is subsidization of phones, not by, by the carrier, but by providers of, of web-based services, companies like, like Facebook, Google, banks, and even governments, because connectivity is important. So what happens with maturation? What happens with maturation is you see fewer breakthroughs. This year's new I, I product, iPhone, will not have as many changes as last year's or the years before. The same with Samsung. And at the same time, Good enough is good enough. So the, the less expensive smartphones, which have been around for a while, are now pretty darn good. And a, a price-conscious buyer doesn't feel obligated to spend as much as they can in order to buy an adequate phone. We see processor speed adequate. We see better screens. We see just gener generally more featured and more polished devices. And what we're also seeing is little differentiation between the brands. The major features are largely in there. Apple is a different product. But the feature set isn't all that different, and quite frankly, the user interface isn't all that different. What that means is that, that uh, vendors are, are increasingly challenged to do the thing they have to do, which is take customers away from other vendors. What we also are seeing is increased specialization. We're seeing it primarily at this point in the size of the screen, but we've also seen water-resistant phones. We've seen phones with the capacity of supporting multiple SIM cards for travelers and things like that. And that's what happens with, with products that mature. It's, it'll be interesting to see going forward what kind of specialization we will see. Um, certainly camera emphasis would, would, be, uh, would be one area where, where companies will com come out with specific ones. Uh, Nokia has been doing that for quite a while. So when we look at the implications for vendor of a largely saturated, quite mature market, we see the lower ASPs. We see that, that the, 
the the pro, in order to get a good enough phone, you don't have to spend as much money. The new entrants to the market are more price sensitive, and therefore the ASPs will come down. The top end prices will stay high. There's always a top end to most markets. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the the iPhone 6, at least the larger screen version, comes out at a, comes out at a higher price. We do see lengthening life cycles as there's less and less reason to to trade in, and that there are there are um, uh, provider plans that reward not trading in every two years. And basically the land rush is over. The land rush is where, where uh, people race to get uh, newly available land. Now what, what vendors have to do is claim customers of other vendors, and that's a much more difficult task, and it's a much different selling proposition. And we see pressure on, on margin. So this this is this is true even at Apple, where we've seen some pressure on margin. It's been largely seen in in, in a, a tendency of Apple to p- pack more and more more capacity into their phones, lowering their their gross margins. We're certainly seeing it at Samsung, and of course, uh, most of the other companies are are already selling at very low margins. I showed this slide last time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. But it's a good list of some of the changes in the market. In the past, customers were seeking performance. Now they assume performance, and they're looking for other reasons to buy specific devices. Price was less important in the early days. Now price has become more important. Service was secondary. It was all about the device. Service is now becoming primary. New features are exciting customers. Now new features tend to bore the customers. They're not as interesting. They're not as different. The relevance is harder to establish. Customers want to do new things with their devices. Customers are pretty used to the to the devices, know what they can do with them, and now want them to be easier and and, and to use and and solve their problems more readily. Design mattered from the from the start, but now design matters even more. And durability didn't matter as much in the early days. Now durability will matter a great deal as you look forward to keeping your device for a longer time, and you also have experience with devices being fairly vulnerable. Now, what does this do in terms of vendor strategies? In the past, you were winning new customers, new to the category, new to the platform. Now you have to take customers away from the competition. In the past, if you were a smartphone provider, you had to satisfy the network providers. Now you have to delight them because they have a long list of potential vendors to to sell. You have to be an attractive choice to the customers in the at in the network provider store. Now you have to actually pull customers into network providers. In the past, you were adding many new features. Now you have to add major new features, features that will differentiate. A list of new features is no longer uh, a draw at a at a product introduction. It has to be a surprising feature. In the past, you had to promote them. Now you have to explain them because the the major features. Have, the obvious features have been have been done, and now these they're they're new and innovative features. Some of which are quite good, but they're not necessarily easy to get. If you if you uh, paid attention to the the new Amazon phone announcement, you saw how at what great detail Bezos went into the 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 claims for the the 3D and the user interface and the shopping features. Uh, in the past, you built. Uh, hero devices, that, flagship devices that led the product line. Now you're looking to buy specialized devices that will cause customers to switch from your competitors. In the past, you emphasized performance, and now you're emphasizing reliability and durability. So how are you going to get profits and growth in this market? As always, we're looking beyond the device. We're looking at, at peripherals, accessories, and subsidiary services. And we've talked about devices as a service, and we think this is an avenue that, that vendors should look at, especially in the PC market. This is providing PCs with, with a full boat of services, including insurance and replacement, an online backup and restore. So basically the customer is assured of continual availability of the PC. Um, but it, the, the PC is still being thought of here as a device, even though it's being leased and will be replaced. So it's, it's not just devices as a service. But it's, it's service as a service. That is, what the customer wants is the service provided by a PC, the ability to, to do those productivity tasks, the ability to do everything a PC can, can do. And the same thing is true of, 
of phones and, 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 and tablets. What they want is their capabilities. The, the devices are a necessary step in getting those. And the closer you can come to say, we will give you what these things give you, and software vendors, of course, have done that by moving some of their software into software as a service, uh, the, more, the more possible that is. And then, of course, the translation of service as a service into English is service. So what we need to drive with these services is a closer relationship to the customers. That is to say, better support, better relationship, and better branding and identification of the customer with with the vendor. Uh, you can see that with, with Apple, and I think that is a possible uh, uh, avenue for, for all device vendors, even when they're not premium vendors like Apple, to simply make sure that the, the customer knows that their product is coming from that vendor, that the vendor likes making that product, the vendor wants the customer to be satisfied with that product, and the vendor will help that customer use, uh, get the service out of that, that device. And then moving on to things, the Internet of Things. So let's talk about things. First of all, things have been around for quite a while. Most of us have a connected smart device that can be accessed from the Internet in our home. It's called a router. It's not very pleasant to deal with for the most part, but they've been there for years. I bring this up to say that, that the thing adoption, the Internet of Things, not that it will be slow. It will definitely accelerate as, as more and interesting devices are produced that, that people are interested in buying. But really all the pieces have been in place for quite a while, and it's up to the vendors and threatening third parties to to exploit the potential in ubiquitous network connectivity, in inexpensive devices, in low power consumption, all those sorts of, of things about things. We expect a lot of growth in it. We don't expect it to have the, the, the level of rapid adoption and industry expansion that we saw in, in uh, devices. But but we expect the Internet of Things to become increasingly important. It is growing now. It will grow at a faster rate. And it will not fall, you know, just as it will not take off like, like smartphones and tablets, it will not fall off like smartphones and tablets. The industry reaction is very rapid, though. The embracing of the Internet of Things has been extremely fast. And, and we're going to have a, a familiar scenario here with, Lots of interest and lots of writing and lots of passion, and that followed by disappointment and was it real or it's real, it's happening, it's fast, it won't be as fast as the industry and the industry commentators, including us, will make it. Winners. So there's two categories of winners to talk about. There's the kind of it's easy and they're always going to win winners because um, network providers, um, storage providers, analytics providers, middleware providers always benefit from more data in the system. Microsoft in particular is, is setting up uh, Azure as a, as a middleware integrating platform, as a, uh, as a uh, Internet of Things integrating platform, a form of middleware. It wants to drive its analytics with, with data coming from from things, and it will, as well as the other major analytics vendors. These companies will be competing with each other, but they won't be competing as hard as the device vendors looking for devices that fill out their suite. For the device vendors, it's going to be very intense competition. For the same reasons that, that most platforms have to be open to foreign devices, most device ecosystems have to be open to foreign things. So we're going to see things coming from different vendors playing with hubs, and that includes smartphones, coming from other vendors. And there's going to be a lot of aggressive movement in the things market itself. The single largest company that's, that's driving on, on, on uh, consumer things is Google with, with the acquisition of Nest, Nest and then the acquisition of Dropcam. We can expect them to be producing more and more devices of this type. I'm expecting them to actually exploit the opportunities in home networking because that facilitates their other businesses and perhaps exploit their, the opportunities 
in VoIP telephony, a place where they've played in the software end of the world and they could, could play in the hardware end of the world. A lot of this activity depends on smart acquisitions because the inventions come out, in many cases, come out of, of startups. There was an announcement today of a very interesting new thing, a, a, a smart band from uh, Xiaomi, uh, priced at approximately $13 U.S. dollars. It combines some sensors for, for activity, heart rate, and sleep, and, and uh, the ability to turn on your device. It's just a, a modest plastic band, but I think we'll also see some very aggressive price competition as, as these become mass market items. The challenges are going to be intense competition and competition from outside your own ecosystem. So I, I've also shown this slide before, and I'll run through it fairly quickly. So what's a winning strategy? This isn't, uh, there's no secret sauce here. Everyone knows these things, but let's just review, uh, and it applies to virtually all products. So you ha and if you want to introduce something no new, you have to provide an upside for the buyer and an upside right away, something that, that does not involve installations, learning to use something, any kind of barriers to gaining the advantage. You've also got to minimize the downside, and those are the things I talked about, the barriers. It can't have a large instruction manual. It can't be difficult to integrate. It can't require you to change the way you currently do things. You have to provide a clear path for the user to go, for the buyer to go, and the buyers are commercial and consumer, for the buyer to go from the way they do things now to the way they'll be doing things with this new and future future product. It's another way of phrasing the minimize the downside. You've got to tell the story well. You've got to explain what, why life will be better with the new thing, with the new service, with the new uh, 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 software. You, you need to be able to tell the story. A story is something that the buyer can put him or herself into and see how life will be better after the purchase is made. And then you have to be lucky because the competition in this space is intense and only a few uh, competitors are going to emerge uh, victorious. So we come to the, the end of our webinar. I've tried to cover a lot of ground. Things have been happening in this segment. So uh, please, I invite questions. Great. Thanks, Ezra. And thanks to those of you who sent them through. Uh, Ezra, we got four questions in queue right now, so please do send them through if you have any additional questions for those out there listening. <clears throat> so, Jack and Ezra, the first question we have is, uh, what other changes do you see coming from Microsoft? Well, what I see is, is uh, what had already begun even before Nadella took place, which is a breaking down of the silos inside Microsoft, helping drive a breaking down of the, the, um, the, the barriers between the products. Now, this is going to be a challenge in terms of how to price them. So you used to buy one product or another product and add the prices. And I think what you're going to see is more holistic platforms with features and a pricing strategy based on what features you, you buy. Now, of course, Microsoft has been moving very rapidly into both a hosted and a subscription basis for, for, for acquiring Microsoft services, and it, and it will continue that. I think, as, as Nadella said, you'll see faster-moving uh, decision-making, and you'll see a more rapid evolution of the products. Microsoft has been releasing upgrades of its products at a very steady rate, but re releasing updates, and I may be getting this wrong, the difference between updates and upgrades. It's been, it's been fixing bugs and, and, and all those kinds of things coming in on a weekly basis, but the, the changes to interface and feature have been much more episodic. I think those two things are going to begin to merge. Um, this, this will be a challenge for enterprise, and enterprise probably will find a way to, to hold these changes off and do them more periodically. But end users have come to expect products that evolve as they use them, and Microsoft could definitely benefit from that. Next question, please. Sure. So as we actually understandably have a lot of interest around what's happening with um, IBM and Apple, so I'm going to read you a couple questions and then you can answer it in kind of a bigger, bigger, bigger way. Um, the first sure. question was, will other enterprise vendors engage with Apple? Will IBM work with other mobile vendors? And we've got a couple people that have asked to go, for you to go into a little more detail 
around IBM and Apple announcements. So if you and Jack want to tag team on that. Okay. Um, Jack, you go ahead with, with uh, some, and I will supplement. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks all for joining, by the way, today. Uh, it's been very nice, and uh, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to engage with the, uh, the outside world, as it were. Um, so will, will other vendors, will, uh, excuse me, will other enterprise vendors engage with Apple? And Ezra and I are, are lockstep on this in that they've already been engaging with um, Apple to various degrees. This is a more formal announcement that's very directed at um, not only the, you know, certainly the enterprise customer space, but specifically into the big blue accounts where there's a lot of opportunity for both IBM and Apple to increase their or expand their uh, relative footholds or beachheads or what have you within those accounts. IBM certainly gains the ability to position a lot of its data harvesting and data analysis solutions. IBM, uh, excuse me, Apple in turn um, continues to uh, sustain and in some cases actually improve the traction that iPads uh, have within the enterprise, say, for some of the uh, more cursory mentions that it gets um, at the C-level executives where they're primarily just using it or have been using it um, as a peripheral or as a uh, luxury device, if you will, in tandem with their primary computing device, most of which of the time is a Windows-based desktop or notebook PC. So I think it, it's not so much that we expect that there will be a blockbuster agreement to the extent of what we've seen with Apple and IBM, but there certainly will be a higher profile for the types of um, engagements between those two companies, given that the IBM and Apple agreement really does cover a lot of ground from the devices and then down through the network infrastructure as well as a lot of the back end and back office services uh, such as uh, big data and analytics before it gets out into the cloud. So um, in tandem, I think you could probably say uh, that, that IBM will, will continue to look for ways to enhance its standing within the mobile community. Um, this is in reference to the other question as far as will IBM work with other mobile vendors. Um, the, focus for IBM in that arena would be positioning its security, configuration, management, mobile device management tools, um, the kind of um, the mosaic of all the different types of solutions that go into the mobile enterprise, uh, which is still kind of a squishy topic. So there's a lot of room for, ben for different vendors to, to move around and uh, vendors like IBM are getting closer to actually defining what that means to their particular addressable markets. Certainly a devices play helps solidify the areas that, that those types of solutions would be uh, sold into or that the value proposition of an uh, enterprise-wide mobile device management system, for example, would, uh, would, would be put into play. So I think there's opportunity for IBM to not only clarify the market at large, but also begin to carve out its own sections of that market and really begin to claim ownership of that through a uh, more formalized or a more uh, readily apparent uh, partnership with other types of mobile vendors, not necessarily hardware vendors, but perhaps you know, with some additional mobile software type of place. The other thing I wanted to add was there's a possibility here of, of something that, that I think would be quite innovative. Um, uh, Apple and, and IBM are working together on the clients, on the, on the iOS end of, this, of these uh, products. And the opportunity here is to exploit um, Siri-like voice recognition. We believe that, that the kind of pseudo-natural language represented by Siri, Cortana, Google Now, um, will become very significant in the enterprise space. And we believe most of the vendors are actually working on this. But the ability to query a, a business intelligence application or an ERP, ERP application with a voice uh, for, for upper management or for decision makers, um, they're not going to put analysts out of business, but they'll be able to get answers to their simpler questions more, more quickly, I think is, is coming soon. And if if Apple and IBM are collaborating on providing a voice interface to ERP and, and 
and BI system, they would be the first on the market unless somebody, of course, moves a bit faster than they do. And, and that, that'll be a big, big news and a big noise, and that'll be significant. Okay. Uh, we have a couple questions about Google, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, the first question we got is, how does Samsung Google agreement of integrating Knox capabilities into Android L benefit Samsung and Google? Um, and then the follow-up from someone else would be, where is Google going in the enterprise space? Okay, Ezra, I can probably take the first half of that as yes. far as Knox. Yes, please, please. Okay, great. So Knox, it's the, uh, the once and future king of mobile security, right? So what, what was interesting about this particular announcement, there's been a little bit of hubbub in the industry about uh, Knox effectively being discontinued or perhaps even the intellectual property for that uh, shifting directly into the Android fold over at the Google headquarters. So while well, we're still waiting clarification on exactly what that is, both parties have come out in staunch support for the technology. Um, so as far as that particular battleground, we're still waiting to see uh, who's left standing in that or what the real or what the real story is there. But ultimately, Knox is an important piece of establishing this will hinge a little bit, I believe, into the discussion that Ezra will have on uh, Google in the enterprise, is that Knox is a an important tool, or we feel it's an important tool to helping Android become uh, a enterprise grade type of uh, solution. Google's success and therefore Android and therefore Samsung's success has been uh, tremendously focused on the consumer market and with some of the more fluid topics such as BYOD or choose your own device really beginning to resonate within the enterprise over the last couple of years but ultimately begin to morph into a, a viable platform from which these workers, you and I, as well as our peers and friends in the industry, we, we we really do look to these particular devices as, or uh, our, our Android devices um, as a, not only a communications platform, but also in some respects a productivity platform. And for corporations and organizations and enterprises to be able to treat that exchange of information as basic as it may seem, for them to be able to treat it with the same degree of controls and security policies and oversight and overall management as they do their current PC networks is a really big step forward for establishing what we've seen as a primarily consumer mindset kind of invading the enterprise. Well, now it's really beginning to, I wouldn't say mature, but that it's beginning to progress into a platform from which you can um, not only provide hooks into the enterprise network, but also uh, through the use of either custom written applications or from the commonly available applications that are available today, uh, really begin to use your phone or your tablet or, um, or your phablet as a, uh, as a companion device to the workhorse uh, notebook or desktop PC that you might have on your desktop as opposed to um, a device that simply either responds to colleagues' requests or allows you to check email. So there's definitely a movement forward for the next version of Android to bring certainly some consolidation of the different types of security features that are available on that mobile platform, but also begin to establish Android as a legitimate contender for um, an enterprise's mobile device strategy platform. I don't have I don't have much to add. I think that's that's pretty thorough. You know, Android is 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 there. It's in in businesses, and unless they want to start buying phones for their for the users, they're going to to have to integrate them into their systems. Okay. Uh, we have one final question right now. So, um, the question is: You mentioned that users are bored with new features, but what are the other areas for further innovation in smartphones? Okay, I, I I think there there are areas and and there are certainly areas of which I, I I'm not aware or haven't been able to think of one, but but I I think that that the the identification authentication piece and the security piece are places where uh, a certain amount of, of of innovation is necessary. The the the, the fingerprint sort of works for some people, doesn't work for everybody. Typing in a code is not Tolerable. The the fact that that in in both operating both major operating systems, one code uh, 
is is necessary for 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 both business and 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 uh, private email is is probably not the best thing. So I see some definite improvements there. I also see uh, definite improvements in in charging. So we'll, we'll have we'll have standards in wireless charging to just make life easier with 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 these devices. Um, and 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 I think we're going to see some some more significant improvements in in the camera, the camera that has become the de facto camera for for everyone. I think that's an area where where we'll see some some significant growth. Okay, we actually just had a follow up comment uh, question rather for you, Ezra. Do you see further device conversions, especially phone capability in tablets? Um, I I think. I'll take it, and Jack can add add to it if he if he wants. I think phone capability in tablets is is almost here, but that's different than the two in one. You only need to buy one thing. the 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 trade off with with tablets versus versus uh, uh, phones is is one of of size and convenience. It's not a technical trade off, and for many users, a, a device that has a screen large enough to read and use the web is not comfortable to carry all the time and, and, and pocket. Uh, so in that case, uh, I think many users who can afford it will go for, for two devices. For users who are extremely price conscious and who can tolerate a larger device, uh, the, the phablet, the, the mid mid-sized devices is, is a great solution. But the ability to, to, to use any of your devices as a phone, uh, at, you know, up to the point of holding a large device to the side of your head, I think is, is a feature that, that is already in place in a lot of cases and will continue to, to be more available broadly. Yeah, I definitely yeah. see it more as a, when you're stationary and you have the device in a position where you could uh, more easily cradle it or more to, or more easily hold it um, with the possibility um, of Wi-Fi calling or uh, basically um, kind of a, another step in the direction of voice over IP with that type of connectivity, um, a promise of some of Apple's um, upcoming software or product releases and certainly other vendors would, would follow suit given the size of the opportunity. But I think to Ezra's point, it's I, I liken it to some of the frustration that vendors are having with um, establishing smartwatches or any kind of wearable electronics, where they're still tethered to a, a device most of the time, is it's, and that device is usually a smartphone, um, some of the offerings seem a little duplicative. Um, there's a lot of redundancy and overlap in terms of what the devices can do and ultimately how much more of a convenience is it really for you to have something on your wrist when we're already very accustomed to taking the phone out of our pocket as we're walking or, or what have you. So I think it's, it, from the technology standpoint, it's absolutely there. Uh, we see it a lot, especially with video conferencing as well as some of the uh, 3G and 4G enabled um, Android phones that are uh, current, um, Android tablets rather, that, that are out on the marketplace. And it's, it's a capability that is definitely uh, waiting to happen if the audience is there, but I think the technological capability currently is a little bit of um, ahead of demand. And if somebody were to crack the code, um, I don't discount it, but I still think that the majority of communications would be done over a much more portable and easily grabbable and uh, perhaps even a little bit less of a social stigma rather than holding up an oversized device to the side of your head too. So. Thanks, Jack. Uh, and thanks, Ezra. So we don't have any additional questions in queue at this moment, so what I'm going to do is start to wrap up the webinar. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who attended today, and I want to thank you for your questions, and thanks to the analysts for providing the presentation and that insight. A um, couple quick things. You are going to be getting the deck uh, sent out to you tomorrow, but I want to draw attention to um, at the back of the deck there's information about the coverage areas that Jack and Ezra are working on give you a quick snapshot here. Um, these are the vendors that are covered both from a report standpoint as well as the benchmark and we are looking at um, the performance metrics and business strategies of these companies. So if you have questions about any of the vendors listed here, please do reach out to Jack or Ezra and they'll be able to give you more insight. Um, as I mentioned, I was going to share all the social media links with you and so Jack and Ezra are both 
fairly prolific uh, social media gurus. I think they have to be. Fairly. Uh, fairly. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, not to put too much of a marketing spin on things for you. Okay. Um, so I do encourage folks to follow both Ezra, Jack, as well as TBR at the Twitter handles listed here. They are coming out with stuff, uh, ideas, and uh, opinions on a daily basis. Uh, as well as joining us on the so uh, sorry, social media sites of SlideShare, YouTube, and LinkedIn. A lot of our content is going up on those um, URLs, and so you're able to get access to that, as well as our uh, website. Uh, and I'll give everyone on the line a sneak peek that we are going to be unveiling a new website in the next couple of months, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, as you're leaving the webinar, there is a short survey, three questions, uh, radio buttons for two of them. How valuable was the presentation today? How good were the presenters? And if there's any other open-ended feedback, um, if you have questions or comments on uh, or suggestions of how we are performing the webinars, we are taking that feedback very seriously because we want to make sure that you guys are getting value out of these presentations. Uh, and so we do incorporate that from quarter to quarter to make sure that we're addressing your needs specifically. So we do look forward to getting comments back from you guys. Um, so with that, I'm going to have to shut the little webinar. We're going to keep it open in a couple minutes in case there's any last minute questions or you'd like to set up in the conversation with Jack or Ezra about what's happening in the devices marketplace. And if we don't hear from you this quarter, uh, we look forward to giving you guys an update of a presentation in the next three months. So good luck with all of your endeavors and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.